ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد in the 10th year after the hijrah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he stood on the mount of arafah during the month of dhul hijjah and he gave a very profound khutbah which in islamic terms is referred to as khutbatu wada'a the fell the farewell khutbah and in this khutbah the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave many instructions commandments advices to this ummah that would suffice them until yawm al-qiyamah the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam after praising allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after praising allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he began by saying isma'u minni fa inni la adri alqaakum ba'da yawmi hadha fi mawqifi hadha he said listen to me listen to the words that i'm getting ready to utter for perhaps i may not meet you after this day in this same place again inna dima'akum wa amwalakum wa a'radukum alaykum haram ka hurmati yawmikum hadha fi shahrikum hadha fi baladikum hadha the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that indeed your wealth and your blood and your honor are all sacred are all haram are all sacred like the sacredness of this day which was the day of arafah the day in which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frees more people from the hellfire than any other day throughout the year like the sacredness of this day like the sacredness of this month which was the month of dhul hijjah which is one of the sacred months on the islamic calendar fi baladikum hadha and in like the sacredness of this land which was the city of mecca فَمَنْ كَانَتْ عِنْدَهُ أَمَانَةً فَلْيُؤَدِّهَا إِلَى مَنْ تُمِنَ عَلَيْهَا Whoever has a trust that was given to him by someone else, then let him return that trust today. Let him return the trust today. He said, إِنَّ رِبَاءَ الْجَاهِرِيَةِ مَوْضُوعَ وَإِنَّ أَوَّلَ رِبَاءَ أَبْدَأُ بِهِ رِبَاءَ عَمِّي إِبْنَ عَبَّاسِ Ammi al Abbas. The Prophet وسلم, he continued by saying that indeed the riba, the interests of Jahiliyyah, of the pre Islamic era, today is waived, is no longer. He said, and the first interest that I will start with today is the interest of my own uncle Abbas. And he told Abbas to stand up and he waived the interest of Abbas. Meaning anyone that owed Abbas interest on any money that he loaned to them or any property that he loaned to them from that day forward was no longer valid. The Prophet ﷺ continued by saying, In the shaitan, ayyuhan nas, in the shaitan, kad yayasa an yu'bad fi baladikum hadi. He said that in O mankind, O people, indeed shaitan has given up all hope to be worshipped in this land of yours, meaning in the Arabian Peninsula. That shaitan has given up any hope to be worshipped in this land of yours. But the shaitan, he would love to be obeyed in anything less than worship. Anything less than worship. ذَلِكَ مِمَّا يُحَقِّرُونَ مِنْ أَعْمَالِكُمْ from those things that you condemn or those things that you look down upon or frown upon from your deeds. That the shaitan, he has given up uh, all hopes of being worshipped, but he loves to be obeyed in anything that is less than that. The Prophet wasallam he continued by saying, أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّ نِسَاءَكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ حَقَّ وَلَكِنَّ عَلَيْهِنَّ حَقَّ he said, O oh people, indeed your wives, they have rights over you and you have 
um, rights over your wives. O people, indeed your wives have rights over you, and you have rights over your wives. He said, لا يدخلنا, لا يدخلنا أحدا تقرهونه بيتكم إلا بإذنكم. That none of you, no woman, no woman, should allow a man to enter into the home of her husband except with his permission. He said, ولا يأذن ألا يتئن فرشكم غيركم. That the woman should not allow anyone to enter into your home or to sit in your home without your permission. فإن فعلنا ذلك ولا يأتينا بالفاحشة فإن فعلنا ذلك فإن الله كان أذن لكم أن تعذلوهن وتهجروهن في المضاجع. He said that and upon you is to provide for them and to provide a, a roof over their heads or to provide a place for them to live with what is reasonable. وَأَخَذْتُهُنَّ بِأَمَانَةِ الله. And you have taken these women in marriage by the trust that was given to you by Allah. So we have indeed taken these women in marriage by the shahada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ فِي النِّسَاءِ Fear Allah concerning your women. And treat your women with kindness. He said, have I not conveyed? He said, O oh Allah, bear witness. Have I not conveyed? O oh Allah, bear witness. Ayyuhan nas, innama al-mu'minuna ikhwa, la yihillu limri'in ma'la akhihi wa illa an tibi nafsi. The Prophet sallallahu continued by saying, O oh people, indeed the Muslims are one brotherhood. The Muslims are one brotherhood. And it is not permissible for a man to take anything from the wealth or possessions of his brother except with uh, his permission. Have I not conveyed to you this message of Islam? O oh Allah, bear witness. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued, أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّ رَبَّكُمْ وَاحِدْ كُلُّكُمْ لِآدَمْ وَآدَمْ مِنْ تُرَابْ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, O mankind, O people, that all of you, that your Lord is one. O people, your Lord is one. And all of you are from Adam. And Adam was created from dirt. And indeed, the most pious of you in the sight of Allah is the one that has, uh, or the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the one that has the most taqwa, the one that has the most piety. The Prophet continued by saying, لَيْسَ لِعَرَبِي فَضْلٌ عَلَىٰ عَجَمِي وَلَا إِلَّا بِالتَّقْوَىٰ That there is no virtue for an Arab over a non-Arab except with the virtue or the merit of taqwa, of piety. He continued, Allahumma fashhad. He said, Have I not conveyed to you? O oh Allah, bear witness. He said, فَيُبَلِّغَ الشَّاهِدْ مِنْكُمْ الْغَائِبِ Let those from amongst you that are present today convey my words to those who are not present. أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ قَسَمَ لِكُلِّ وَارِثْ نَصِيبَهُ مِنَ الْمِرَاثِ He said, O mankind, O people, Indeed, Allah has distributed amongst your inheritors their inheritance. He said, وَلَا تَجُوزُ وَصِيَّ فِي أَكْثَرِ مِنَ الثُّرُثِ And it is not permissible for anyone to make a bequest for more than a third of his inheritance. إِنْ لَا يُقْبَلْ مِنْهُ صَرَفٌ وَلَا عَدَلٌ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ He said that no uh, supererogatory deed or no obligatory deed will be accepted from him if he does this and may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. If I was there, um, I believe that, uh, number one, the atmosphere itself, just hearing the Prophet wasallam speak, hearing you know, the clarity and the eloquence of his Arabic and the profoundness of what he's actually mentioning and what he's highlighting and accentuating in his khutbah, um, it will have such a profound impact, just the atmosphere alone and the stillness, the quietness of everyone listening, as they mentioned that when the Prophet ﷺ gave a khutbah, 
it was like as they gave a metaphor it was as if birds were on their heads meaning there was so the stillness the serenity of the air and the atmosphere that alone is enough to have an impact on you um, as human beings we give off vibes and we can actually feel vibes so when you step into a, a, an arena and you step into an atmosphere that it has that serenity and has that, you know, that level of tranquility, that in itself is enough to calm you and to put you in a different zone at that moment. And then when you look at the content of what he was talking about, um, he, he addressed everything from the social ills of his community. As a lot of times we tend to look at the prophet's community and we tend to think that it was just a perfect world. Um, and this is for those hopeless romantic Muslims who believe that during his time it was just everything was perfect and it was by far perfect. It was no different and, and, and um, no different than the communities that we deal in with today, that we live in today, that we frequent today. Um, the same ills socially as well as religiously. Um, so the, the, the profoundness of the things that he touched on. Um, you walk away from a khutbah like that really wanting to change your life, really wanting to do some introspection about your approach to Islam. And I think that that was the whole objective, considering that that was the last khutbah that he gave. He died a few weeks after that. And, um, you know, always going back and looking at this khutbah and reviewing this khutbah and the content of it from the social ills, as he talked about, um, you know, um, the, the you, you know, the transgressing against another Muslim in terms of his wealth and his honor and, you know, those things. Um, he dealt with racism, racism, which, you know, unfortunately still exists in the Muslim community today, not from a religious perspective, but more from a social perspective. Um, you have racism that exists uh, even amongst, you know, cultures within themselves, not necessarily the racism that they uh, project or the racism that goes on uh, across cultural lines, but even within the same culture, there's racism. Uh, and there's racism on different levels, but he addressed it in terms of there's no virtue of an Arab over a non-Arab, or over a black man over a white man, except with taqwa, putting everything in perspective, except with taqwa, except with piety and righteousness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, he dealt with interests, and the, the giving of interests, and the taking of interests, and it shows his impartiality as a leader because the first person he started with was his own family member. As he mentioned in another hadith, Ibdat bi nafsika wa mata'ul, begin with yourself and those in your immediate family circle. A lot of times as leaders, we tend to um, take this message out to the, you know, to the masses of the people and our family members are the worst ones. And so, you know, as a leader, it shows his impartiality that, you know, he didn't give, there was no double standard with him. And, and, and the proof of that is that he began with the invalidation of the pre-Islamic forms of interest, starting with his own uncle, starting with my uncle Abbas stand up and he waived that, meaning that anyone that owed him interest up to that point henceforth was invalid and was no longer. So as a leader, it showed his impartiality, and that is what makes people feel comfortable with the message of the person that's delivering um, such a profound khutbah. Um, the other things that he dealt with in there were, were you know, um, you know um, the treatment of the women. And I mean, of course, pre-Islam, uh, you, you know, the Arabs, they, they looked at women in a very you know, um, deplorable light in terms of... Um, burying the women alive. Allah mentions in the Quran that if, you know, the news of a, of a girl was, was given to one of the fathers, his, his face would be red with disgust and he would be embarrassed and in shame. And he would be conflicted on whether or not he should live with the woman in shame in the community or bury her, yadusaha fi turab, or bury her in the dirt. So this is, you know, Allah mentions in Surah Al-An'am, in Surah number six about um, that the uh, Arabs that what they used to do is that if the um, cow or the camel gave birth to a child, um, if the child died in the womb, then they would give the meat to the women. But if the, the, the animal came out sound and healthy, then the meat would only be for the men. So this shows you, and I, and I mean there were many other atrocities that went on in their communities, and the Prophet ﷺ was putting everything in perspective. That these women, they have rights over you just as you have rights over them. 
the Prophet Wasallam put everything in perspective that there is no virtue over one group over another except with taqwa. And I think if we put the focus back on our piety and our righteousness before God, then we could eliminate all of the other things that we try to use to show our superiority over other people. Those things are irrelevant. Those things don't matter. The only thing that matters is your piety and your righteousness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last thing, which is you know, a very important thing, uh, which is the women's rights in Islam. Um, from the beginning, from the beginning, Islam has given the woman a very special station. And women, as revelation continued from Mecca to Medina, women have continued to gain prominence through the verses of the Quran, through the treatment of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi towards his own wives. They gain prominence. Aisha was a scholar, religious scholar. Um Salama was a religious scholar. These were people who some of the tabi'un, the generation that came after the Sahaba said that we never had an issue with the religion that we didn't understand, except we went to Aisha and we found that she had some knowledge about it. One of Aisha's students, he said that I'm, ama I'm not amazed at Aisha's knowledge of, um, of the lineage of the Arabs because she's the daughter of Abu Bakr. He said, but what I am amazed is at her knowledge of medicine. How did you acquire it? Where did you acquire it? Aisha said that when the Prophet ﷺ was sick and he was on his deathbed, we called doctors, um, you know, physicians from all around. And these were Muslims as well as non-Muslims. Here again, showing you that interaction with Muslims and non-Muslims. As a matter of fact, the Prophet ﷺ died and his armor, his shield and his armor was in the possession of a Jew who he owed money to. That's how they did business. If he didn't have money, he would give them something. The same thing we do today. Um, you give something you know, as, as a loan to hold, as collateral, and the person gives you whatever they give you, and until you paid it back, the person doesn't give it back to you. And he did this with a Jew. He died and his armor was in the possession of a Jew who he owed money to. So there was an interaction between them. There, there was not you know, social interaction. I mean, even religiously, sometimes the Jews would come to the Prophet Sallallahu for you know, certain regulations and rules and guidelines utilizing Islam because the, the religions were so close. Okay, so Aisha said when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was on his deathbed, we called doctors from all over to treat him and to, you know, um, to assess him. She said, and it was from there that I learned the knowledge of medicine because Aisha was very keen. She used to pay attention. She was very perceptive. And it was from there that she learned the knowledge of medicine. And she excelled in you know, Islamic sciences, I mean, you know, beyond what the average woman would have ever been able to do, simply because through the interaction of the Prophet ﷺ with his wives, women were able to gain prominence in the religion all the way up until today. Of course, and then you have Muslim countries and you know, Muslim cultures today that suppress that, that don't give women that type of platform where they have a voice, where they can function in their own realms. Um, without naming any names. I mean, you have countries that, you know, they suppress that. Um, but Islam, um, and, and we have to make a distinction between what is cultural and what is religious. And I think that is another problem because the two are kind of mixed with certain cultures. It's hard to separate culture from religion, but it has to be separated because we need to distinguish what is culture from what is religion. What does the religion sanction? Okay, so for example, uh, in certain Muslim countries, women are, are not allowed to drive. Women are not allowed to drive, and they have their own reasons for that. Um, but can we attribute that to the religion? Can we say that the religion says that women are not allowed to drive? Now you can search and, you know, I mean, as Shakespeare said, that the devil could take the Bible, verses from the Bible, and use it to his own advantage. So if you wanted to say, well, this verse and this verse applies to that indirectly, I mean, anybody can, you can do that with anything. You don't, you, I mean, like, you don't need verses of the Quran to do that. You can do that with anything. Um, but the, the, the point that I'm making is that um, Islam has always been an advocate for women's rights. Women have always had certain rights and have been given certain um, liberties in the religion, both socially as well as religiously. Women were allowed to work even during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, um, the, the, his, his daughters worked. Uh, Fatima, who was married to Ali, she worked. She worked so much so that she had blisters on her hands. And she went and she asked the Prophet Sallallahu for a maid, to give me a maid because I'm working in the field helping my husband run his garden. Ali had a garden where they would sell fruits and vegetables because that was the uh, method of commerce in, in Medina. In Mecca, they were buying and selling you know, merchandise. 
when they moved to Medina, um, it was about fruits and vegetables. Um, so Ali had a garden and Fatima used to work in the garden and she had blisters on her hands and she came to the Prophet and asked him for a maid. The Prophet said, no, I'm not going to give you a maid, but I'll teach you something from the religion. And he taught her Ayatul Qursi. And the scholars, they explained that the reason why he didn't give her a maid is because he wanted her to rely on herself. Relying on another human being in Islam is totally forbidden unless it's absolutely necessary. So he was teaching her to rely on Allah and not necessarily rely on another human being. Because when you rely on another human being, it makes you vulnerable. When someone does something for you, you feel compelled to return the favor. So as a result of that, it takes away from that that feeling of indebtedness that you owe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that should only be for Allah and never for another human being. You should never feel indebted to another human being. Um, so, you know, um, women's rights and um, these things um, uh, Islam has always advocated and in the Prophet Wasallam's final khutbah, he wanted to sum up the whole of the religion. What he did in one khutbah, he summed up the whole 23 years of revelation in one khutbah. And this is, you know, from the eloquence of the Arabic language, as the scholars say, khairu kalam ma qalla wa dalla, that the best of speech is what is short and to the point. And that's exactly what he did. He summed up the whole religion of Islam in one khutbah. 23 years in one khutbah. 